what we're going to do is ask each of you two to respond a little bit to um, sort of where Harriet took us in thinking a little bit about communities and how they face these decisions. We'll come back to markets and a bunch of other things, but I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about communities that think about relocating and have had to and communities who would rather not. And so maybe we'll start with you, Elizabeth, just to talk a little bit about your work and um, you know, that'll obviously play to a, to a home crowd here. So maybe you can locate us in, in your work. Sure. Um, so I'm a writer and I've, been, I've spent a, the past five years um, on the ground in seven coastal North American communities that I would consider marginalized in some way, shape or form, physically, financially, um, that are already facing um, having to come to terms with living with rising sea levels. And so um, I've actually spent a lot of time on the Isle de Jean Charles that Harriet uh, spoke about briefly, and I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about that. I think she gave us a really phenomenal introduction into the really uh, diverse set of challenges that face us as we start to think about what it means to come to terms with a future where sea levels are rising and more coastal communities are at risk. Um, so one of the other communities that I spent a lot of time in is Oakwood Beach in Staten Island. And I think for sort of an introduction to Oakwood Beach, if you think about that U, that big U that was a winner of the uh, Brazilian Sea Design Competition here in New York City, New York City has 520 miles of coastline. Manhattan makes up 32 miles of that. And that means that there's 490 other miles that we have to figure out what to do with. And we're not necessarily going to have um, the funding to do these really innovative, large scale infrastructure projects all over New York City. So one of the communities that I got really interested in was this community of Oakwood Beach, Staten Island. And I should say that I was teaching at the College of Staten Island when Hurricane Sandy came ashore. And as I watched sort of the slow piecemeal uh, recovery efforts and my students, I mean, after the storm, I lost half my students. They just disappeared. Um, and some sort of trickled back into the classroom. Some were gone for the rest of the semester. Some you know, international students often ended up going back home and sort of giving up their, their time at, at CSI. And I started to think about, you know, how did this storm affect Staten Island in a way that was fundamentally different from Manhattan? And you have this coastal community, Oakwood Beach, Staten Island, it's very sort of lower to middle class, working class folks. Um, it's a community that is literally situated on top of a wetland, on top of land that was you know, for a long time considered wet enough to limit its development potential. And we've put a community there. Um, and I think it's not surprising that the folks who live in that community often don't have enough money to really come deal with the regular repeated loss that comes with flooding. Um, and, and that they're sort of in this peripheral space within the municipal uh, city government funding stream. So they often feel sort of left out they have flooding problems. They're not regularly being addressed. Um, Hurricane Sandy came ashore, literally you know, ruined 50% of the homes in Oakwood Beach, killed three. Um, and that community, after Sandy, said, we don't want to live here anymore. And I was really surprised by that, because to me, it's sort of like, retreat is a four-letter word in a lot of municipal discussions. Um, you you know, the, the idea is that you lose property value, you lose uh, income through property taxes, you lose the ability to keep your civil services functioning because you've lost those other two aspects. And so I was sort of curious how this community came to the idea that they wanted to get bought out by the state government and then how that happened, especially since you know Oakwood Beach, Staten Island is a pretty red neighborhood and one where folks wouldn't necessarily say they believe in climate change. Um, so I was curious, you know, what was really like the type, what were the shifting points or the moments that made them do some of the most innovative, like resilient design. I think retreat should be considered a form of resiliency. Um, so I was curious how that ended up happening. They, so 
the longer I spent in the community, a couple things sort of stood out to me as triggers for them. One was that they did have this tremendous loss of life during Sandy, and Oakwood Beach gets flooding because it's a wetland community. When you have a major storm event, lots of rain, the rain runs off the upland areas and ends up soaking the community sort of from within. And then you also can get coastal flooding because they're on the shore. Um, and so there is a, there's a berm on the side of Oakwood Beach. And during Sandy, that berm kept the Atlantic out till about 7.30 at night. And then you had a storm surge that was greater than any they'd ever experienced, and it topped that berm. And the water rushed into the community um, really quickly and knocked a lot of homes off their foundations, dragged them out into the wetlands. And also, I, I would argue that that sort of force of that water was part of how you got such a tremendous loss of life in Oakwood. So the folks were like, hey, the, the minimal infrastructure support that we have not only are we having a hard time getting it repaired, but it also might be sort of keeping us imperiled in this community. Um, that was one trigger. Another trigger that they had was um, they had a really slow recovery, and they felt like you know everyone else in New York City was going to get help, and they weren't going to get help. So this, they decided that they wanted to go after state funds to get bought out. Uh, I think it was like February, so we we're like four months out. Um, from Sandy, and there was a discussion at a local community church um, around sort of what resources were available, to whom, where, and a local real estate, I would say sort of a mini real estate magnate, that's maybe overdoing it, but um, he owned a couple of rental properties in Oakwood Beach, and he had heard about the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, which um, helps to buy communities out that face repeated loss. Um, and the part, a key part for Oakwood Beach was that if they sold their homes, they didn't want it to be developed again. They really had a strong sense of community identity. And they were like, if this is going to turn into you know, really fancy townhouses or coastal high rises, I'll rot here, I'll drown here, you can't have my <laughs> land. And so, I mean, I got these really strong quotes walking around in the community as they were trying to figure out whether or not they were going to leave. Um, and one of the ways that, so the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program demands that if you sell your house to the state that that land then uh, remains, I would say, like a kind of commons or it can't be redeveloped. Um, that was really key to getting people interested. And then you had this sort of grassroots organization where members of the community went door to door and explained the buyout process to each other. And that's something that I think has been a little bit more problematic in the Isle de Jean Charles in terms of like who starts to carry that information into a community about the possibility of retreat and relocation. Um, and then finally, I will say that the city decided to offer a 5% incentive on top of the closing cost of the house. Um, so they said the state is sort of help funding this through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. We don't want to lose residents if we can help it. We'll give you a 5% bonus if you take that money and you put it towards buying property in the municipal New York City municipal area. And then there was another 5% if you stayed in Staten Island. I, I'm almost 100% sure of that. So in some ways, I think that uh, that's an interesting way to think about retreat that also tries to keep some of the uh, social resiliency of a community in place where it's possible and starts to you know, take into consideration some of those fundamental concerns that play out at the local and municipal level in terms of, you know, what does it mean if we lose a, a sizable chunk of our residents? How do we deal with that and stay sort of a functioning city, a functioning municipality? So um, I think I'll leave it at that, and I will hand it over to David. That's great. That's great. And I'm sure we'll come back and have okay. lots of questions. So David, maybe you want to give us the, the other side of some of your experiences in helping people in a, in a slightly bigger city stay, as it were. Mm. Yeah. Um, first, I'm an architect, so I appreciate certainly Borough Happold's uh, having me participate. Um, there comes a time, 
uh, Kafka, I, I can get pretty dark, so <laughs> uh, you already know that. But you know, the threshold moment for Kafka is when the thing you perceive as tragic, you take as merely serious. You know, and I think that's what happened in New Orleans uh, 12 years ago, however many now, these eons ago, uh, it was very serious. You were displaced, we were in New Iberia. I didn't want to be in New Iberia, it sounded better. Lafayette sounds better at a distance uh, to me. Uh, but there had to be something you could do. So you took seriously this question, and New Orleans is different. We work also, we've participated in almost all of these processes, Rebuild by Design, and in DRC, we have four uh, cases, including New Orleans and, and La Safe that we're working in now, and Norfolk, um, and also Bridgeport. So we understand, they're all different. But the New Orleans case is, is unique. I mean, it's, it's at the bottom of the river. It's pretty much, unless you made the decision to let the Mississippi River go at the Old River control structure, you need a city there. And there's too much petrochemical industry in the lower Mississippi River Valley for that to happen quickly. Um, the question is like, the, what's the value of the port? And there were people who said, well, forget the port. That's not the future. Well, then forget the argument to fund it if you don't have the port. But the uh, work that was being done, the $15 billion that was spent, the large appropriation after the cleanup and all the money that went away for that, uh, was for a flood defense system, hurricane protection system, <clears throat> later called the hurricane risk reduction system, hard engineering. Much of what was learned for RBD came because of the mistakes of that situation. Um, we had other processes, Rockefeller also funded, that were really community driven. And if you looked at the key words, the key word was community. People wanted to be made whole, wanted to be home, wanted all that, but it, you had to go to 64 or 5 to find the word safety. And so we started to engage with the Dutch um, and really to try to look holistically. I'm an architect, and you know we're pretty good at asking questions. And we frustrate engineers so much because that solution is only part of the answer, and you can execute that. Engineers have ideas, but we have questions. And we, we have come, I've come to understand the value of the story. I mean, the people in Norfolk say that whoever has the best story is going to win. It's not the reality. I mean, Hollywood, look at America. We're living in this mythical condition. So you know, we had to create a story about New Orleans. Well, the people in New Orleans, after all these processes, you just find unified New Orleans and all that community, they didn't trust much. And they did trust the Dutch, for better or worse. Um, but we got into this sort of Calvinist-driven, you know, we're going to try to do the right thing. And what's missing? And what was missing was anything about landscape, anything about the inside, anything about how you could safely live there, because the most of the loss in New Orleans before the levees collapsed, before these walls collapsed, were, was rainfall. And we have horrible repetitive loss from that, but nobody's dealing with anything about the internal system except more concrete structures and more pumps. So we came in to do a landscape repair program. I think we could talk about that, uh, about landscape repair. I think that um, really we cultivate the land, we cultivate the mind. I think there's a direct connection. I think there's a spiritual connection between water and, and people. But there also needs to be in this question about staying or retreating, whichever the choice, there needs to be a, uh, an infrastructure reduction program. I mean, I would hard, heartily advocate for that. I was at NASA Langley yesterday, and that's maybe six to 10 feet above sea level, vital resource. It's where the you know, space program all uh, really generated before Johnson uh, Space Center. And you know he came after Kennedy, and therefore the real work occurred at Langley. Uh, but they're moving in. They're not able to move up, because I just told you they can only go up so far. But they're starting to move in. And when they move in, they're taking the infrastructure out, which is better than what has happened in the Delta in Louisiana because the oil companies come and take the resource and leave the infrastructure, which is just a hazard. That's just a time bomb ticking. So whatever the program, whether you're staying or going, whether you're choosing to live inside a levee and you're going to have to pay to reinforce that levee, the more assets you're putting in place and the more things that are outmoded that you're leaving behind, the more irresponsible as a society we are. 
And I don't know how we mine the value of that and capitalize on that, but it's not so different, the choice to stay or go. It's really the choice to be prepared. And I think that being a Boy Scout, I'll leave it there. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, I have like, I, I realize I have so many questions and not a lot of time because I want to leave time for the audience. But I wanted to start with one thing that's something that kind of is inherent in what all three of you are saying. I was struck by Harriet's um, portrayal of how, how much of our country um, has been built up along the waterfront. Right? Now, some of that obviously makes sense because you start with ports. That's how ports are located, obviously, on the waterfront, and that's where our commercial center started. So it's, it's, totally understandable to me that major communities like Norfolk, like New York, you know, like New Orleans have access, have access to water, so they are flood prone. Um, but I'm interested in what's behind that number, because there seems to me there's, there's two type of folks who gravitate to these watery places. One, people who have, and I think about places like the Jersey Shore, and maybe I shouldn't, or the Hamptons, people who have second homes and can afford to have beach places that are out there on the water, and of course, they are vulnerable, and they probably know they're vulnerable. It's also not where they necessarily live as their primary residence. But then there's other people um, that I think about, which is not necessarily Lower Manhattan, although some of the Lower East Side certainly was vulnerable, but it's places like the Rockaways and places like that circle around Jamaica Bay where you have much lower income folks who essentially live on land that's either far away from the center, but also not very good land for building on. I mean, that's the history of the Collect Pond in the Lower East Side in New York City. So I really want to just explore a little bit that sort of social equity question, because when you think about people and people living on the waterfront, they're not all the same. And some people may be better prepared to take risks than others. And I just wonder what the implications of that might be as you guys think about it in terms of policy or in terms of community. And I kind of open it up to any of the three of you to start. Well, HUD, the agency that I last worked at, um, you know, has uh, been around for about a half a century. But long before there was a HUD, uh, poor people uh, had housing and land that was cheap. Uh, what made the land cheap? As you say, it was maybe distance from the center, it was not convenient. One of the big things is that it, was, it didn't drain well, right? It was land that other people didn't find desirable. Some of that, the, that housing ended up in the HUD portfolio when HUD came into existence. Um, and, and before we had flood mapping, mm -hmm. right? A, you know, a lot of housing was there. So I mean, it was a, it's a big issue, uh, you know, at my old agency to figure out, we have this portfolio. You know, what, what do we do with it? How do we move people? It, when, we, when HUD, you know, at its fullest is funding one of every four uh, households that need affordable housing, only meeting 25% of the need. And in most places, the market rate affordability that used to be there in any place with any kind of a moderate economy, that market rate affordability is gone. So if you were to ask any poor person who is at risk of being homeless, would you rather stay in your housing there might be a flood next year or in 10 years. It could be a really big one in 25 years. Or, you know, do we, or can we tear this building down and, you know, Godspeed to you? They'd all stay in their housing, right? Their, their risk is so much more immediate uh, from being homeless or, or even having the threat of potentially being homeless. So it's, it's something that we really haven't grappled with. But I will say that uh, just like just like many other things in our economy, this is something that is going to strike the people with the, with the least means to address it the worst. And so that's why we have to think of it first. Yeah, it's, it sort of makes me think um, in terms of flood insurance and flood insurance reform. So um, if you, the, in the, in the world of retreat, there are two kinds of retreat. Managed retreat, which is sort of what I spoke about, where you have a government agency intervening and helping that community make the transition. And then there's something called voluntary retreat, where people just up and leave. And um, I would argue that voluntary retreat is often not voluntary, that there are a set of um, policies that make those vulnerable communities unable to stay in place. And one of the things that I think is a real potential to sort of be a driver for voluntary retreat is uh, some of the issues that we face with flood insurance reform. So as Harriet mentioned, 
you know, a lot of our coastal properties have significantly subsidized flood insurance policies. And were that subsidy to be removed, those low to middle income families couldn't afford to live there anymore. We are at the moment where we're slowly, it's about, I think it's 18% a year, we're removing the subsidy on flood insurance to get people up to their actuarial rate. Um, and, you know, to give sort of a human face to this, Oakwood Beach, the community that I was speaking about, 95% of the people left, 5% roughly stayed. One of those people was Frank Acosta, who um, literally the amount that the city was offering or the state was offering to pay for her house, she had bought it at like the height of, you know, the value of property, um, couldn't really help her get out from under that mortgage. It left her with like $20,000. And she was like, OK, I would rather stay in place and continue to have a home that I love than leave if I'm going to literally uh, not be able to afford to buy anything else after this. And I've stayed in touch with her. And I'm, I'm working on a piece about flood insurance and flood insurance reform. And um, she just sort of figured out that she's paying $2,000 a year for her flood insurance policy. She's at three feet above sea level, which in her neighborhood is 10 feet below the base flood elevation, which is what she needs to be above in order to get a reduction in her flood insurance policy. So in the neck, you know, she's going up to $15,000 a year. And when she figured that out, she was like, I better take the offer now while I have it. And I think that that's a really clear sort of uh, case study in how flood insurance policy can uh, sort of spur a large scale migration away from the coast of low to middle income folks. And then, you know, is that this weird way in which climate change is a gentrifier uh, in our coastal communities? And what do we want those communities to look like? And, you know, how do we continue to value all the people who make our cities tick? I would just say in that situation, I mean, we talk about single purpose solutions. It's not just about moving people away from the water. I mean, every community has a whole set of issues that they're grappling with. What if you said, let's simultaneously solve for this problem. No loss, no net loss of tax base, right? Uh, we have a pattern of segregation very likely, at least by income, maybe by race. Let's try to fix that, right? Let, like, there's a lot that you could do if you were doing a large scale kind of relocation. Uh, you'd have to change your zoning and do other tough things, but a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. You know, that would be a great point to have that dialogue. I'm just saying that you could, if communities were willing to engage, you could solve for a lot of these things. Not that it would be easy, it would be really hard. But the solution isn't necessarily, uh, you know, a, a fixed pie that people get less of. You could actually make the place better. And there's really no chance of equity without growth. I don't believe. Without what? Without growth. I think stasis is the enemy of that. Um, a lot of the, the formulas, I agree, you have to solve a more complex equation. I mean, I saw in Norfolk with the 3 by 3 by 3 which is a core study of protecting Norfolk, you know, we did a review and the way they divided things, is certain areas have higher value and certain areas have lesser value and they're separating them instead of combining them so that you're benefit cost analysis would say you can only afford protection for the wealthier area. You have to look at the bigger geographic area to understand how you would fix the poverty issue as well as the protect the wealth and the value of the place. But it's, it's not easy. And in New Orleans after Katrina, people knew that resetting New Orleans as a tourist-based economy with Bourbon Street as an icon was a bad idea. But what are you going to do? You need money. You're hungry. You're, you've got to set something back. And those interests are vested. The people who make money on tourism in New Orleans, the restaurants that you guys enjoy and all that, the Carl area of those restaurants is subsidized housing because those workers don't make any money. And so they work, but they have to live in subsidized housing. So the, it's, the, it's the economic mix. Unless you provide a real economy to New Orleans, you're always going to see poverty. And you're always going to be at risk of when's the levy going to fall down next time. 
So really the economics are, are what has to drive a lot of this, and poor places generally don't have anything but survival, subsistence, you know, I, I definitely want to come back to the levies in a sec, but I just wanted to ask a follow-up on that question. So t taking your view, Harriet, that we should be able to think about this in a broader way and bring in, you know, and this is like a, an engineering question, have, you know, multivariant solutions, right? Um, who does that? Okay, now we've all witnessed different levels of government. You've been involved in, you know, city, state, and federal government. And it's not easy. We're witnessing it right now because it's very hard for our mayor and our governor to, um, they agree on everything, but they can't agree together. They have to take turns doing what they're doing, even though they totally agree on everything. So, you know, this is the inanity of, of, of government. We won't even talk about the federal government at the moment. But going forward and putting personalities aside, I'm interested in what you three see as the roles of those respective levels of government. And that could be place-based, or it could be something that's, you know, for our country, this is the right approach. And I don't, I don't know how to begin to think about that. I mean, New York City is a tough example because it's larger than whole states and whole countries. Right. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really big place. But I will say that um, I really put a lot of trust in local leadership. I mean, increasingly, we live in a world where the federal government is a gap filler, not a funder, mm -hmm. not the place where you should expect to go for leadership. That has to come locally. I, I really do believe that. Um, and, and, I, and we had some examples. We talked sort of briefly about you know, those places. Uh, I didn't mention Valmire, Illinois, but Soldiers Grove and, and Grand Forks, North Dakota. Those were local leaders who said, and, and, and what's really interesting, none of them solved just one problem, right? They said, oh, we have this flooding problem, but we also have these rising energy bills in Soldiers Grove. Let's make, let's, when we build the new buildings, let's make things all solar, you know, and really give people a break on their energy bills. Let's really, uh, you know, invest in the renewable energy economy. Let's do some different things. Let's um, let's let's move to a part of town where where the infusion of market rate housing uh, would would be beneficial. We'd have a more mixed income community. So, I mean, I think you you need leadership. All of these things are an opportunity. They're not just a crisis. They're not just a bad thing, uh, but but I think I think it is hard to do, and believe me, these conversations aren't easy to have. You know, with with people, you know, nobody wants change. I mean, there's nobody out there in any place that any of you live who's saying, "Yeah, bring it, change." I love change. Would love to see change in this neighborhood. No, nobody wants it. So you really have to have those kind of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, retail conversations with people about what are the consequences and and everybody as much as they hate change everybody has an aspiration for their community they they have something they'd like to see more of They're, they have something they'd like to see improve maybe they have a lot of things and so it's really aligning those things with each other that really opens up a whole new world and in these places that have done those totally voluntary relocations we didn't make anybody move they decided it would be better for them and that they would use the federal money plus a lot of money that they put into these projects themselves to remake themselves and, and guarantee a better future. And for the most part, that's exactly how it's worked out. So I will say your question made me think of the next community that I'm going to spend time in. I'm going there in two weeks, so my response will be uh, not as on the ground as some of the other uh, others that I've given. But I'm about to head out to the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's in some ways, like no surprise to me that they're sort of at the cutting edge of thinking about how to live with sea level rise. Um, one thing that I've found really interesting in my work is sort of thinking about wetlands and the role that they play in terms of a natural buffering system. In San Francisco Bay, like so many other places, has lost over 90% of its wetlands in the past 100 years for a number of reasons. Um, but they're at this really interesting moment where the city government decided that a lot of the wetlands were turned into salt ponds uh, to, in the middle of the century, well, I could be wrong on that. Again, my knowledge is not as, as super sharp on the San Francisco Bay Area. But um, there are all these salt ponds that ring the bay that used to be used for salt extraction. And um, the city about 10 years ago bought them from Cargyle in a huge mass and they said we've, start to we've started to recognize the importance 
that this land can play in sort of buffering us against rising tides in the future. And there, a lot of the poorest communities in the San Francisco Bay Area are alongside those salt ponds. And then interestingly, you sort of have this private um, equity going into the problem because a, you know, Facebook is on the bay alongside former salt ponds. Google is along the bay alongside former salt ponds. So they're getting this partnership between private money and state money to figure out how do we create um, a wetlands infrastructure as a buffer that also can keep pace with sea level rise, which is another real interesting design problem in terms of we know that wetlands can keep pace with sea level rise, but maybe not the rate of sea level rise that we're going to see. So can we pump more sediment into the water column to help them accrete um, and grow up quicker? So you have a lot of sort of interesting public private partnerships out in San Francisco. Right. I think he's addressing some of those. Um, I wanted to just have one last question, then I'll open it up, which is um, I am not an engineer and I'm not an architect, but there's but I, I, I fancy myself sometimes a historian. And when I looked at what happened here um, after Sandy and we looked at all those flood maps and I certainly looked at the map of what happened in Manhattan and, and guess what happened? All of the areas that have been built out since Manhattan was its original skinny island are the areas that flooded. So no surprise there. And of course the areas, the, the barrier islands like the Rockaways have been constantly changing over time just like Hog Island and other places on the Atlantic coast are changing. So part of my question is about how you guys, you know, feel about the fact that we have cities there and obviously there's certain communities that we're not able to move because the volume of economic activity is, is so large. But in terms of cities and investing more in places that we know are extremely vulnerable, and that more sometimes is economic stimulus to the economy for growth and more housing of all types. And I've seen cities putting affordable housing very close to the waterfront now, even though we know that there are issues, you know, who knew? Um, but also in terms of the, the fighting it with, um, with, with gray infrastructure and the amount of money that we are spending to defend places that may ultimately be, um, be losing battles. So I, 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 you know, I come at from it from a sort of, well, you know, this is a process of constant change and maybe we should take a realistic perspective on where we can and yeah. shouldn't be investing. But Maybe my turn to talk and yeah. talk about that. That you know, you, you can see repetitive loss and flooding occurring where they where we filled in the creeks. Correct. I mean, uh, in Correct. Norfolk, it's a direct overlay where the flood exactly. occurs, where the creek was filled. Yep. Um, but back a bit to the government. You know, the, it's very difficult for these institutions to change. When we did the water plan in New Orleans, we did an institutional analysis. But basically, if we had only dealt with institutional change, we wouldn't have even addressed the problem because these institutions exist not to fight the current war. They're fighting the old war. In New Orleans, we just spent, we're spending almost through spending, and we knew in the water plan and built it into the thing, a billion dollars on hard gray infrastructure, right. giant underground canals right. that in 1920 may have been a good idea, but they've been proven for 50 years not to work right. and to cause subsidence yep. and everything but yep. the Corps of Engineers, and yep. if you want the money, and therefore you can't even change the profile on top. It's not okay. You can't be in a world with this much change with institutions that will not, cannot, and we don't, it's not just the core. It's all, and we don't, we're not even really addressing the problem at hand. And I think it's really in this redefinition of the problem and taking this as serious. You know, San Francisco has a lot of wealth, you know, at, you know I, I don't know why I go personal, but at, when I came back to my father's house after uh, Katrina broke the walls, he said, I always thought it would be San Francisco. Hmm. You know, we expect, he expected San Francisco to be the city that was demolished. We don't know what's next. Hmm. And I think as, uh, if we don't understand where our mutual assets are, what our self-interests are, because a lot of people don't even know their self-interest. I'm pleased when somebody acts in that. But then if I understand what my family interest is and what my neighbor's interest, then, then people start to move. But if the institutions stymie the good ideas and refuse to accept anything, and this could be your local Department of Public Works, because let's face it, the manual was created and that's the way we do the street. That's not going to be the street you need. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is no uh, easy way up and out, but there's no better alternative than to 
you know, work toward that, or I, I don't know where to say move. It looked like Wisconsin was pretty safe. <laughs> Canada looks good for lots of reasons, but um, the, the thing I was going to say, like I'm a planner, you know, at least I've been playing one on TV for 20 years, but, um, and I will say one of the issues, and, and I've been to so many places around the country where there's a sustainability department and a resilience planner, and all that stuff is really great. I need someone to crunch the numbers. You need a you, you know you need a money plan. Yep. Like you need to be able to say, you know, how you can hold constant or maybe even improve the balance sheet of the city by making these investments and that guess what? You're not getting rid of your waterfront, you're preparing for a new waterfront. Right? There's always going to be a waterfront. It's just not going to be where it is right now. So the whatever value accrues to that waterfront is going to still be there, right? And maybe you protect it better and longer by providing this buffer area that's also public access on the days, which are most days, when there's not a disaster happening. So I, I do think it's that financial side of it that we haven't, where we haven't spent enough time and we haven't had our sharpest minds at work mm -hmm. like that. And, and again, the planners aren't either being asked to solve for that. There's, they're being asked to show me you know, an idealistic kind of uh, solution as opposed to mm, what would really have to happen with density? What would really have to right. happen with agreements with surrounding jurisdictions? You know, how could you maybe revenue share, yeah. right, to, to get these solutions? But it's not a catastrophe. I mean, the good news is we've so underinvested in infrastructure for so many <laughs> decades that, that if we had been investing in the right things, that are it, investing at all, it would have been in all the wrong things. So the fact that we haven't been <laughs> spending the money on that could be really good if we can figure out what the right thing is quickly. Great. Okay. Well, with that, I think we should open it up to a few questions from the... Uh, from the audience. Yeah, I see one right here. You want to stand up so we could put, yep, yep, you. Hi, uh, so a lot of the cities that you've been using as, I guess, case studies for this have been relatively public cities, like San Francisco. Uh, we talked about Miami, uh, New York City specifically. Um, and you also brought some context to Jersey Shore. I'm from Jersey Shore. Uh, my community is basically destroyed. Um, but the thing is, with a lot of these communities, they kind of lack the adaptive capacity to make the right decisions to, um, that uh, a lot of you have actually put forth and some of your uh, some of your responses. But so my question really is, how can communities like that, or even smaller communities, particularly some like different areas around the United States, specifically in Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, um, how how do you build the best the, uh, the best capacity for those communities to make those decisions? Does that make sense? It yeah, it makes it makes, it makes total sense. sense. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, not, I'll, let, I'll let you start, David, you go ahead. Let me start. Um, I don't work in wealthy places typically, so maybe I understand that. Um, you have to look sometimes beyond the place itself. I mean, Bridgeport, Connecticut bears a regional, as you said, it's a sharing thing and it provides <laughs> utility energy to the whole region. Um, how do you, it goes back to the financial question, but in the Louisiana SAFE program, the HUD funded program, there's six parishes involved. Those are counties to everybody but us. Um, but each of those sessions is to try to get people to look at their assets and look at their histories and look at their, you know, what's happening with their coast and understand at a bigger scale their issue, but not at the scale that's been being planned that's beyond them. You can go too big. You can go to something that's global and it won't relate. You can go to the scale of the CPRA and the Mississippi River and all the diversions that never happen, right? So you have to get back into the local scale and say, what is in your interest? And see if you can come up with a homegrown uh, idea. And then, you, but you still need some outsiders. We may have needed the Dutch. Maybe, uh, you know, Norfolk needs us now to plan their investment, you know, that, but, You've got to be looking at your investment, and it's not just money, it's time. I mean, the people who've come to New Orleans and spent 10 years are owners in a way. And a lot of people think if you don't have your, but really you just have this amount of time. And so I think you, the community time is very important. So you have to make it worthwhile for these people, right? And so many times you go into these sessions and they're all the same. No solution offered, no pers perspective offered, but we need transformation. So it's got to come out of the place. You need some outside input, and you've got to have some idea that it's possible. 
But getting back to what David said about how some of our institutional arrangements seem to be irreparably broken, mm. or at least not contributing meaningfully to a solution, like I have to say, and I say this with love, I love my colleagues at HUD, I, I love the work that, that they do. I do, I did sort of strike me, I wasn't someone who worked on these issues very much coming into that agency, but it just struck me as crazy that we would, you know, that, that I would be responsible for managing $50 billion in disaster recovery money, you know, working with people who didn't know much about disaster recovery in states and local governments all around the country, you know, and, and trying to let them lead those, those projects. None of them are experts, right? So there's a huge cottage industry for you people who are trying to figure out what to do with your life now. <laughs> Just the disaster recovery stuff, and that's a growth industry, let me tell you. But part of what I would say is, again, the simultaneous solution, right? So for the folks that you're talking about in your New Jersey community, if, at the shore, like, like the idea of having to pay higher insurance rates is an anathema, right? But, but what if you, you required insurance of everybody and you required the insurance company, let's say it's a private insurer, to offer risk-adjusted premiums? So you were constantly getting a price signal, not just about what your real risk is, but what, is the, what you could save by taking certain actions, right, to reduce the potential losses. And that maybe your government, you know, could could use a mechanism where a bunch of insured people could decide to have an infrastructure solution that would reduce the premiums of everybody kind of behind that infrastructure solution. So imagine that I wanted to retrofit 5% of the properties every year and get those and get those insurance premium reductions. I mean, that's a construction industry that exceeds the size of new home construction. Right, so it's permanent jobs that can't be exported in a community. Most of them need these kinds of jobs, right? The middle wage jobs are the ones that are leaving the economy the most rapidly. I'm just saying that we could solve simultaneously for these problems if we were just willing to be thoughtful and to think about a broader set of solutions. Um, and, and there's so many co-benefits with things that, for every building that we would retrofit for a hazard like wind or like water, and some of it, it's not practical to do, but for many of them, there are things. You could also do more energy efficiency. You could do renewables. Those things also give communities resilience in the time of a disaster. Um, it, it, it reduces the likelihood that you'd have a disaster in the first place because you're cutting the carbon. Anyway, that, that we're, there are things that people could begin to do. Uh, so why don't you run for office in your community <laughs> and start talking about it? Great. Do we have another? We had a question over here. Yep, white t-shirt. I'm afraid that's all I know about you. Uh, hi, thanks so much for this, Fox. Uh, I was noticing in, in both these, the entry for this competition, as well as just in the stories you guys were telling, this emphasis, uh, oh, great, thank you. Uh, an, an emphasis really on, in, in rebuilding and relocating and a resilience on reaction. And I was wondering about the role in actually combating climate change sort of at the source where you were seeing uh, that kind of work being integrated into these projects, maybe into these proposals or into these communities. And then was also thinking that like, it certainly isn't coincidental that uh, indigenous people in this country and in Canada who have been relocating and rebuilding and relocating and rebuilding for over 500 years are both at the front lines in, in coastal Louisiana, coastal Alaska, as you discussed, and are also on the front lines of like integrating their own resilience into combating the sorts of climate change. So extractive industry, uh, fracking sites, um, Standing Rock, uh, as well as like uh, combating Justin Trudeau's pipeline projects. So I, was, I don't know, I was wondering like what other examples or I mean, if you, if you want to talk about the role of uh, indigenous people specifically in this struggle, that would be great. Thanks. Sure, so my mind goes two places at the same time. The first place that I think of is a group of folks, the Swinomish, out in Puget Sound. Um, they've been doing, they came up with, you know, a community resiliency plan a decade ago, and they have long understood that the wetlands that are integrated into their community help them um, not only sort of have buffering from storm surges, but uh, also, certain estuaries are really key to the salmon migration. So they did this sort of integrated approach where they started to build 
pocket estuaries off of the main river that runs through their community to enhance and sort of make robust, more robust, the wetland system that they live alongside. And at the same time, they got the double benefit of creating little sort of, if you think of the, a salmon migrating uh, going against the current, it needs breaks along that super highway to sort of take, take a moment and <laughs> catch its breath. So these pocket estuaries also ended up helping bring salmon back to that community. Um, I will say that you know the Isle de Jean Charles, they ended up on the soggy fringes of Louisiana. It's a mixed group of Native Americans, uh, Biloxi, Chittimacha, Choctaw, Homa. And that area is not recognized as a Native American reservation in part because that community has all of these different sort of uh, they've intermarried, and then they've also married historically with French, French Cajuns. Um, so there's sort of the one of the initial problems there was that that land wasn't reservation land, and so as it started to disappear, no one was telling them, "Oh, we're going to take care of you in the future." Um, so there's certainly been, uh, on the one hand, a call in that community to say we deserve to have space to be this community that's really uh, that we've developed in in this location, and on the other hand, there's been I think a lot of resistance to the idea of relocation. Um, in terms of like, hey, we got kicked, we were here because of the Indian Removal Act, and now you want to move us again. And that's not really um, useful, and especially in terms of thinking about cultural identity in the long run, although the, the winning proposal is about moving those folks together inland as a community, and also um, opening up the number of people that get to move into the new community in terms of anyone who I think who's left in like the last 30 years. Um, gets to be included in the inland community. So, um, there, there are histories in all this. Right? I mean, you, yeah. we talk about the these people, but the Acadians, right? Acadian, and we refer to all old rock and roll, the band, you know, Acadian Driftwood. I mean, they get kicked out of Acadia and they go to Louisiana and they get kicked out of there. And they, I mean, this is a history. And there are all these histories of people who've been mistreated. Um, but the, these people are still connected to the land. And I think one of the problems with urbanites is they don't connect to the land and they don't know what mm. they can do about it. And therefore, it's this sense of what on earth, I'm powerless. And so in the work that we try to do, one of the criteria that we would set high for any project or any expenditure would be that it would be visible. Because you know, out of sight, out of mind, your, your image of the, what's wrong with the wall is, well, I no longer know where I am at all. And I think that people who live in better connection to what's around them, nature particularly. But infrastructure should be visible. A buried canal underneath Napoleon Avenue is not telling you anything. Mm. Right. I think like one last thing to sort of add to that that I think goes back to the gentleman's question from New Jersey is like the power of the story and how a lot of the communities that I've spent a lot of time in certainly five years ago felt like they were the only community that's ever faced or that's facing this problem. And I think, you know, it's um, something that I would like to see made a lot more robust is information sharing amongst marginalized coastal communities that in some ways each, each uh, problem and solution is going to be different on the local level, but there are also things that can be uh, replicated and sort of used like the Swinomish's um, move to sort of, they dug those pocket estuaries. It's not an expensive solution. Um, and I think it's certainly been helpful. So uh, I think it would be really nice to have a robust information sharing network that can help those marginalized communities. It's a super interesting idea. It's a super interesting idea, especially in the age when big cities are finding all these new ways of communicating and, and sharing their challenges. I think there was one other question over here. Yeah. yeah um do you want to grab a mic? I think there's a mic going around that make it a little bit easier. Either that or speak up. Here it comes. So there was a little mention of the Dutch. Um, the Netherlands is the is the is the most densely populated country in Europe, and I think about a quarter of it is below sea level. What are they doing, and can't we learn from it? 
Uh, uh, this is yours, David. What are they doing? They've been doing it for 800 years. I think half of it's below sea level, and most of the GDPs are below sea level. And you know, it's a fantastic example, but it's not a copy-paste model. We learned a lot from it. The densities that the Dutch have give them opportunities. That's something we could learn from it. It's hard in Kansas to make transit. It's hard in New Orleans to make certain tram lines that would make a lot of sense, but we don't have enough people. So I think the American predilection to live far away from each other is not helping us, despite the city where we are. Um, but there, the idea that you're going to overcome nature, I think the Dutch are learning, and I, th I think it, it, they're learning from the other disasters. I mean, from Katrina, there was a big reaction, a new Delta plan, a new look at the, the liabilities. Um, but let me say that the Dutch don't face the most difficult climatic or design problem. The 10,000-year levy that the Dutch have, the 10,000-year protection, it's not a levy, it's three, three levels, would be about 500 in the, on the, along the Gulf Coast because the design storm is so much more difficult along the Gulf of Mexico. But nonetheless, you learn to use all the tools you have, and I think the lesson that I'm preaching tonight, at least, is make better investments. The Dutch, in, they invented the stock. You know, the, the Indies companies were funded by regular people who were investing their money together to make something. So this consensual nature, this polar model of politics where we argue until we come to some solution we can implement is a much better model than this fractious American condition. So I think there are, there's, there's another decade of mining the Dutch for knowledge and examples. And, you know, we could talk more about that. Um, I, they don't pay me, but I, I advertise. For them. <laughs> I, I was saying that we are learning some of their lessons, but not the good ones, right. by by basically encouraging development in cities where it, that are vulnerable, where Utility places rate. are at risk. With the idea being, once there's enough tax value there, you know, we can't help but get get political support to invest in protecting it. But we'll deliberately make those decisions now, you know, Forcing. and hope. That, that people will buy into the, a heavy duty set of investments, seawall and other kinds of investments that will, that will protect what's there. So I think it's, it's, it's questionable whether those are good strategies or not. I think they're not. I think for a place like Lower Manhattan, yes, uh, that you, you already have that investment. But I think in other places, um, you know, it's, it's two million homes, you know, that are gonna be underwater. Right? And long before they're underwater, people will decide, I can't afford to be here because I can't keep an asset that, that is going to go to zero. I, I got to sell now. While, while there's, I can still find somebody out there who would buy it. And I think that's going to have a huge economic impact on these places. That's why we have to start thinking about you know, a more man. We're a big country. We don't have to do what the Dutch did necessarily, as long as we're planning about how we do at a very large scale, some level of managed retreat from the coast. But dumb policies. I was in uh, Hampton, Virginia last night, and a man said he had a $150,000 grant he could get to fix this house. And he says, I don't want to fix my house. I want to take the money and move to someplace safer, but I can't get the money unless I fix my house. There's a lot of stupidity within our regulations, and we can talk about it until we're all gone. But at some point, the House of Representatives has to function. I mean, design comes out of the Ways and Means Committee. I mean, it, but they're not doing that. You know, that's where capital flows move in, are, in our non-planned economy. They are getting a little sick of spending the same money in exactly the same places. I will say that. That's my observation. Now, how that translates into better policy, we have yet to see. It's not doing a lot with NFIP, but yeah. Great. Yes, over there. To what degree do you think that some of the recent catastrophic weather we've seen, like Lake Sandy and uh, Hurricane Katrina, has been caused by global warming versus uh, us just noticing some of the more catastrophic impacts of developing these coastal areas? And um, do you think global warming is the best frame to uh, talk about this issue? At the moment, I mean, I'm, I'm open to suggestions, but you don't have to talk about global warming to talk about risk, to talk about extreme weather. You don't have to talk about the cause 
I thought it was safe to mention climate change in this forum, but I wouldn't be going to you know Speaker Ryan or the Trump administration with that as my uh, as my. I'd be talking about minimizing cost to the government, minimizing risk, mi minimizing business disruption. I don't have to talk about why the the data is out there about you know catastrophic uh, property and casualty losses associated with extreme weather. Yeah. There was somebody else who, there was a woman who had the mic before. Yeah, right there. Hi, um, I'm interested in the issues you're talking about with flood insurance um, and kind of what's going to happen when they're both updating the flood maps and getting rid of the subsidies. Um, and I was wondering if you know of any other ways besides subsidizing flood insurance for reducing that burden for people who can't afford it. Um, and specifically, if anyone's talking about the idea of like a progressive flood insurance that would cost more for those potential gentrifiers of the coasts that you were talking about. I mean, this is the problem of, uh, I'm sorry to go back to my place <laughs> I only get to visit occasionally in uh, Louisiana, but Des Alemans is a, a, a old community along the bayou. And uh, you know, the property insurance goes to $18,000 a year for these people and the house is worth 180,000 or something. They can't afford it. But do you need people to live there? We're just not a nuanced country that says we need people in these situations. And if we do, then maybe there's some way to shift this around. Maybe there's a, his, maybe there's a, a, some historical condition that you soften the blow, but you discourage any new buy, and those, those will cause those, these places to atrophy too. You know, the, the water plan we did in New Orleans was basically a reinvestment versus disinvestment strategy. So you're, you're talking about so many different conditions. I don't trust that the larger body, the Congress, can fix that or understand that. But within the Louisiana SAFE program, those are the kinds of things they talk about. Because New Orleans now having a levy is a receiver community. It actually is a place that you would be safer to live than you're going to be out there. And you're going to, because you're behind a levy, you have less flood insurance. So localized movements and smaller moves may be more possible than the grand strategy and the geoengineering or population engineering. But I, I think that if you do this all at once, you find even more distress in these markets. So I, I, I don't know that Bigger Waters was anything but catastrophic. It's still got to keep moving in some direction. But can they design policy? I mean, all these things are design issues. Did you want to say something to Elizabeth? Um, I guess to specifically try to answer your question, I don't know yet of any, uh, I haven't heard of any progressive um, tax. I should say that the National Flood Insurance Program, I think the max coverage that you can get is either 250 or 500,000. 250. 250. So um, a lot of folks who have much more expensive homes on the coast are getting their additional flood insurance through the private market already. Um, there is discussion around are giving some kind of vouchers to low income folks in flood prone neighborhoods. Is that a way that we could at least signal with the price on your bill, this is what it actually costs to live here. We're going to help you meet that cost um, in the short term and then likely slowly phase out that voucher program. So there's been discussion of vouchers as a kind of bridge to walk between uh, subsidized risk and actuarial risk policies. I would say too this idea that there would be uh, uh, risk adjusted premiums. So right now we adjust the premium if you do elevation above a certain level, but that sort of entirely denies the opportunity for an infrastructure solution. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the time that it takes for the federal government to revise even these backward looking maps is really unbelievably long. So, I mean, the private sector does this so much faster and easier. I mean, if it was me, I would, I would make it a requirement for private insurance, and I would make it a requirement that every insurer has to offer risk-adjusted premiums that are multi-hazard, so that you have this cottage, you have this other industry of people investing at the infrastructure level and at the individual building level in, in reducing risk. And if that was your deal, you could also imagine borrowing tools from uh, the, the conservation community. So you don't want to, you know, the federal government goes in after a disaster and tries to buy people out, 
Some say yes, some say no. Most people are like deers in the headlights. You know, they're not ready to make a decision. It's a limited time offer. Strangely, very few places say yes. If you were trying to get a conservation easement or a donation, you'd say, let me give you some money for this property. Let me, let, let me give you a life tenancy. You know, you can build memories for you and your family in this place until the next disaster, in which case the place belongs to me and I have the land that I can manage to protect other homes, all right? So, so you both get something so that, so that you can invest in another property if you want to, but you, you know what I mean? You have, a, you have something that's more, uh, that's softer, right? That could get more people over time to participate and we're just not using those tools to get to the outcome that we're talking about. There's a lot, the good news is there's a lot we can do to, to improve. Uh, you know, we just need to all be doing it. And going back to the Netherlands, you know, that there is no flood insurance in the Netherlands because it's the government's job. That's not the model we're going to have in the U.S. No. So, but if you, com not. But if you compare these things, you learn more. different. I mean, okay. we've got to learn. I think we have time for one more question. I think there's a hand up back there. Yep. Uh, yeah, so this will have to so be the last. There's a lot of conversation about um, homeowners, but what about public housing and renters? I mean, who's assuming the risk for relocating and um, mitigating for that? That's a really great question, question. And, and this is another area where the federal policies um, uh, haven't historically done enough for this community. So, uh, you know, we rely on property records to understand like who's been displaced and who's there or missing. Uh, I think the example that Elizabeth used that a whole bunch of her students just went away, you know, those were renters of various kinds. They were not homeowners. So, you know, Communities need to be prepared. I wouldn't call this a federal government responsibility per se, but um, I ran, this doesn't sound like it's relevant, but I'll mention it, I think it is. I ran the census um, for the state of Maryland in 2000 and for the District of Columbia in 2010. And by just in that 10 years, the technology that, was, that we really used to reach out to people in 2010 was text messages, right? We texted people. It was during the, the Great Recession and we were really worried that we'd have a huge undercount because people had moved and, and who knows what was going on. We need that kind of a system to be in place in every community so that every person can be accounted for because they are, the, even if you're poor, if there's been a, the, the, a presidentially declared disaster, there's a, an amount of money that people who are not homeowners are entitled to get, but they're, you know, we can't reach them. We don't know who they are or where they are, because a lot of them, once their housing is destroyed, they, they go somewhere else to live. So we're just not adequately prepared for that, but there is, you know, there is provision in the, in, in, in the federal program to pay if we only did the stuff uh, that we needed to do beforehand to identify folks. Did you want to say something, Elizabeth? Okay, well, I think I'm being, being given a couple signals um, from different parts of the room. So I wanted to um, thank our speakers for their interesting talks and commentary. Um, and I'm sure if there's a few of you that want to follow up on particular questions, these guys will be around for the next few minutes. So feel free to come up and, and ask them.